Amen. Hello, everybody. Good morning out there in Facebook land. Wish you guys were here with us. I'm going to say that. We in Philema chapter, I mean, verse 1, chapter 4. I mean, verse 1, 4. I'm sorry. I'm all over the place this morning. Verse 4. Verse four. I, I went all over. I've been to the hospital today. Today is my niece that almost died birthday. She turned 32 through the grace of God. So I'm thanking God so much for that, that I ran to the hospital real quick. I had to pray for her. I had to cover her. I had to make sure she understood that it was God's grace and mercy. And the doctors um, that kept and kept trying to bring her back. I, I thank God for everybody in that situation. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and your faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have devoured much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Through you, Father God, we need refreshing. Through you, Father God, our hearts belong to you. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, in the most powerful name, the name above all names, everything has to bow to the name of Jesus, Lord. Our joy is in you. Our patience, our hope, everything is in you. So, Father, right now, take this service, the word that's coming forth, our praise and worship, Lord, our communion time, and make it yours. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated for the Lord's Supper. And uh, if you don't have the Lord's Supper back on the table there near the sound booth and for those of you at home you can prepare for the Lord's Supper let's look at Psalm 125 as our reading One of the song of ascents as the children of Israel ascended Mount Zion for the Feast of Tabernacles. And of course, we're coming close to that uh, in our own uh, liturgical calendar in Judaism. Psalm 125, verse 1, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. We have this imagery of the Lord's protection surrounding his people. And of course, now more than ever, we need the Lord to surround us, to surround his people. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous, for then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. The Lord's protection, of course, is uh, against all sorts of physical harm, plague, famine, war, natural disasters. But it's also there, as you can see in this verse, for those that rule over God's people. The Lord needs to protect us. He needs to protect us when wickedness prevails in the levels of government the political dimension, the, the, the levels of rule over a people or over a nation. And it, it shows that God's protection is there just as he protects us in the physical realm. 
against physical damage. He will be there to protect us against the rule of the wicked. We cannot help but being influenced by those that rule us. The psalmist continues, Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. There's the protection that God grants in that realm, in the, in the realm of character, in the realm of righteousness and truth. But those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with the evildoers. But the Lord doesn't conclude with a, a word of judgment. He concludes with a word of blessing. Peace be upon Israel, his shalom. Access to his blessing, that's really how the Lord protects us. So we're sitting here today, of course, we're faced with all the turmoil going on in our nation, the political turmoil, the division, division that is even extended into the church. We're here today with, you know, we have fires blazing and, and, and natural disasters. We know that... Uh, Hurricane Ida is supposed to touch land in the Gulf soon. And, of course, we sent out the text messages. We're praying for our brothers and sisters, particularly in Morgan City, Louisiana. You know, the last big hurricane that was headed their way, we prayed as a network of churches and master builders and others, and, and, and the damage was diverted. And so we pray again. And we're not just praying, of course, for our brethren, but we're praying for all the people, the poor, the vulnerable, those who, who will be horribly affected by something like this. We are praying, of course, for our brothers and sisters in Haiti who have already been hit with tropical storms, devastating earthquakes. We're praying for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan and, and we're praying right now we're standing together and what we're praying is Lord as the mountains surround Jerusalem let the Lord surround his people both now and forevermore we're standing together with our brothers and sisters in Christ in the in the Gulf region in Louisiana we're standing together and we're saying not just Lord divert the storm Lord disempower the storm. Let it, whatever reason human beings suggest, let your power, let your power put an end to the destructive power. Let your power of shalom, peace be upon Israel. Let your power of peace, let your power of access to your blessing prevail over this destructive power. Lord, this destructive power of these winds, the destructive power of, of all the disrupted infrastructure in Haiti, the disruption of the, of the terrorism, Lord, that's taking place in Afghanistan, Lord, that has taken place. And Lord, we're gathering together with all our brothers and sisters in Christ right now to partake of your body and blood. When we ask for the demonstration of your power, we see it in Christ dying, Christ being raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, Christ ascending to heaven and being installed in the kingship of the universe. We, we see the power of the Lord demonstrated, and it's a power for good. It's a power for righteousness. It's a power for uprightness. It's a power of peace. It is a power against wickedness. It's a power against evil, Lord. And, and you know, evil in Scripture is, it's, remember the Hebrew language was very, it was a tangible language. It was a very concrete language. We move from the, the kind of concrete language understanding. It's really simplistic images behind the meanings of words in Hebrew to the, of course, the abstract, uh, philosophical uh, reasoning of the Greek language. 
We see a difference, a clear difference between Eastern and Western man there. But evil really just meant harm. Lord, stretch forth your hand against evil means stretch forth your hand against anything that would harm anyone or anything in your creation. And see, that's what the, the body and blood of Jesus means for us. It is a reminder that God stretches forth his hand for good and not for evil, for blessing and not for harm. What, whatever uh, affects advancement, peace, prosperity, healing, that's what the word for good means in Hebrew. Evil is harm. So what, what you've demonstrated in the death and the resurrection of your son, that it is God's will to bless it is God's will to bring peace. It is God's will to do good. And that, the voice of good and peace and blessing, speaks more powerfully. More, it has greater finality. It has the final say over evil and over harm and over wickedness and over crookedness, Lord God. So we stand with our brethren. We... We partake of your body and blood this day with our brothers and sisters in Louisiana and across the Gulf. We, we partake of your body and blood in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Haiti, Lord. We partake of your body and blood in solidarity and unity and oneness with our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan, Lord, and across the earth, Lord. And, and as we partake of this, we bear witness. It says, as often as we partake of these things, as often as we take the body and blood of the Lord, we do show the significance of the Lord's death until he comes. And the significance of the Lord's death is, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forevermore. Peace be upon Israel. Peace be upon Israel the church, peace be upon the peoples of the earth because of what Jesus has accomplished. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to dismiss then for our online uh, Sunday school. So take a minute. Get ready, get your children ready, and we'll get started with the message. been an interesting week or so here. We did finish up last week with part 10 of the church in Philadelphia. We're going to stay in the prophetic nature of the church a series that we've been in for probably close to a year now. I think we started it was in September of last year. But we're addressing these prophetic issues because if there's ever been a time in which prophetic issues are needed. It is this this time. And we are going to continue probably looking at the seven churches in Revelation. They're so relevant. But I want to kind of have a bridge here between the message of Revelation and, and, and things that God are speaking with us. I'm reading a book. I just started it. It's the second consecutive book I've, I've read by this author. And the last one was so good. And then I found out that he'd done uh, uh, a, a more recent book on some of the things he, he, he really discusses how the state of the church, 
uh, and the state of our nation is, is, is impacting us right now in history. His name's Paul McGlasson, M-C-G-L-A-S-S-O-N. And I just really have opened up uh, this second book, but he talks about um, what, what he's, 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 this book was written in 2019. The, the first one I read, I think, was 2012. And he is just talking about the church has moments in her history which we would call confessional moments, significant confessional moments. And what a confessional moment is, is where the things that are taking place in our own experience, in our own history, affects the very essence of the gospel. In other words, a confessional time is a time when the church has to rise up and say no to certain things. And um, since uh, I see Bonna there looking up McGlasson, um, when you get the name of the book, tell me, because I, I don't even remember the name of the book. I, it's called, uh, it's something to do with, it, it's talking about a call to confession. It's a, it's a, maybe it's a call to discipleship. I don't know. When, when Bonna gets me the title, I'll, I'll give it to you. His, the book I read in 2012 is called No. That was the name of the book. And uh, it was so good. I mean, it was so enlightening. I mean, there are books that I read where, you know, they help uh, fit in a piece of the puzzle or they're, they're, they confirm or they, 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 they raise some ways of looking at things I've, I've never seen before. But then there are books that every single page I read, explosion after explosion after explosion. Now, the 2012 book has to, had to do with kind of how the church got where it, where it, where it is today, and that today was 2012 in that book. And... Um, it, what, what was so significant of it to me was it took me back to things that I had like really researched and studied and sought out and, and um, dealt with and read and researched back probably in the 80s and kind of just kind of forgot about some of those things. And he was just, he was critiquing uh, this, this certain movements uh, in the church he was critiquing one particular movement. And, and it just literally, I, I, I had forgotten all of these things that I'd studied 40 years ago. And it, it really helped make sense why we are where we are today in the church. But this book that I'm reading now, the one in 2019, um, and, you know, it... it, it he is equating where we're at now, or he was in 2019, and that's two years ago, where we are now to a confessional moment. The church has moments in, it, in her history and, and actually long stretches where, you know, the, the goal is to preach the gospel and have Christian unity and, and, and advance, you know, uh, kingdom issues in the earth, but you have moments where the very future of the gospel are at stake. Do, do we have it? Choose This Day by Paul McGlasson. Between Andrew and Bon, I knew we'd get it. Choose This Day by Paul McGlasson. And his point is, is he talked about three uh, significant times where the church were in these confessional moments. And a confessional moment, it's rooted, remember when Jesus said, if, if somebody denies me before men, 
I will deny them before my Father in heaven. But if someone confesses me before men, I will confess his name before my Father in heaven. See, a confessional moment is where we have to take a stand for Christ. And if we don't take that stand, if we don't confess who Jesus is, in the midst of the circumstance and the midst of the situation we're in. The situation is so desperate, it's so dangerous that the very future of the gospel is at stake. And he talked about the early church when the great persecutions began. He talked about at the time of the Reformation where Luther said, listen, I've come to this place. You know, they, they, they were telling Luther, back down with these these, these things you're saying uh, about the church. And Luther said, I can't. I mean, I'm paraphrasing it quite simply. He just said, I can't do it. He says, if I back down at this point, I'll, I'll, I'll basically deny the Lord. The third time, the con- great confessional time, was in Nazi Germany when the church rose up in great support of Hitler. Now, those are confessional moments from the perspective of the, of the Western church. Look, let's, 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 let's not take away, there have been all kind of confessional moments, Christians in China, Christians in Iran. It's about to be a confessional moment, or, and it has been in Afghanistan for Christians. I mean, He's looking at it from a Western standpoint. He just said that where we're at right now is a confessional moment. Now, I'm going to look into the book and and see what it is. Having read his last, the book, the 2012 book, I can already tell you, even without reading the 2019 book, read the 2019 book. But we are in a very, his point is we're in a very, very, very dangerous time in church history. It's a confessional moment where the church has to rise up and stand up and bear witness to Christ against what's going on in the earth, in in America, in the church. We, We have to rise up. Now, take that book and then also add to it some prophetic words that, that I've recently gotten on behalf of our church, behalf of our congregation. One was this week from Pastor Mariusz, which, which I will share. Very brief word, but a powerful word. It literally, from the moment he shared that word with me, it's, it's, it's kept my head above waters these last six, seven days since, uh, since he, he, he spoke it to me. We also had a meeting uh, a, a, a Zoom meeting, Reggie Holiday and I and two other leaders, a two-hour meeting, and we just talked. We just talked about what was going on. Now. And some of the things that really start this message off, they come directly from Reggie. It was a combination of what we were all sharing and saying, but Reggie was really, really behind it. I mean, Reggie Holiday is one of my heroes, and when I grow up, I want to be like Reggie Holiday. Uh, the man is just walking in a just a powerful confessional anointing. And, uh, and, and, and it all ties in, too, with what we've been studying, whether it was last year in the Psalms and start of this year in Isaiah, Colossians chapter 1, Isaiah 40 through 66, and now the book of Revelation. And I want to go to Matthew 17. And we talked about Matthew 17 before. Matthew 17 is the disciples at the foot of the mountain not being able to cast out a demon. And we talked about this uh, and the significance of this chapter just just a few weeks back. And while you're getting there, let's pray. Father, I thank you for McGlasson's imagery, Lord. I've been been trying to come up with the words. What makes this hour different even from 2012, or what makes this hour different from 2000, or what makes this hour different from 1970? I mean, what makes it? It's a confessional moment. And so I I thank you for that imagery from Paul McGlasson. Lord, speak to us as we look at your word in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I'm going I'm to look at both the Matthew 17 version and the Mark 9 version because there, there's, there's some different details in each of those. It's the transfiguration followed by this episode of this, the inability of the Lord's disciples to break through with casting out this spirit. And I'm actually not going to start with the transfiguration. The transfiguration has taken place. Well, I, I'll start with it briefly, and then I'm going to go back to it because it's, it's, the, it's the key to where we want to go today. But remember what the transfiguration is, but let's, let's see it described first of all before we remember what it signifies. Chapter 17 of Matthew, verse 1. Six days later, and that's six days after chapter 16, and 16 is where Peter declares that Christ is the son of the living God, and, and Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, my Father in heaven. You are blessed, Peter. And then the next minute, you know, Jesus says, by the way, guys, you know, he announces to him, I'm going to die. And Peter begins to rebuke Jesus, and Jesus turns around and says, get behind me, Satan. I mean, can, that, 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 that one boggles my mind. It's like, oh, pastor, I'm leaving Lord of the Harvest because, um, you know, for 10 years all you did was affirm me and now you've brought correction to me and I just can't quite deal with that. Who do you think you are? C can you imagine if I looked you in the face and said, Satan, get out of here. <laughs> now my wife does say that to me sometimes. <laughs> And, and she's normally right when she says it. Um, I mean, oh, Jesus is so affirming. No, Jesus is about truth, and Jesus is about grace. And Jesus calls it like it is. You see who I am? Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. You don't understand how I'm going to do what God's called me to do? Get behind me, Satan, Peter a.k.a. Peter. You know, uh, his name's Simon. I'm Simon. I've, I'm going to rename you Peter. And that's what, what happens in, in chapter 16 of Matthew. I'm renaming you Peter. You're the rock. That confession of who I am is the rock upon which I'm going to um, build my church. Oh, wait a second, Peter. I'm renaming you again. Satan. The Satan was the adversary. The one who opposed God. And remember what we said a few weeks ago. You can know who Jesus is, but that doesn't mean that you understand what he's doing or how he's doing it. And see, this is the church today. Everybody wants to confess Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I mean, we're at, we're at a point where, where, where they, they ask people, you know, they're doing polling, and they ask people, uh, are you an evangelical Christian? And all these people respond yes, and they say, well, what does it mean to be an evangelical Christian? Oh, well, I, 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 I vote Republican. Like that? That's a confessional status? That's a lie from the pit of hell. It's got nothing to do with being a Christian. But that's how far off people are. I mean, I, mean, I don't even know if those people know who Jesus is. But at least the disciples, they knew who Jesus was. But again, knowing who Jesus was doesn't mean that you're, it's guaranteed that you understand what he's doing, why he's doing it. And, and what he does and why he does it is, Jesus says, yes, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you're waiting for me to establish the kingdom, because he also says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. They're like, yes. And he says, oh, by, by the way, here's how I'm going to establish the keys to the kingdom. I'm going to die. And it just, it just they, they, that was nowhere in their frame of reference. Even though there are, there are traces in, in, in rabbinic thought that said there would be two messiahs. Uh, Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben Judah. You know, one would be Messiah the son of Joseph, one would be Messiah the son of Judah. And, uh, and, and Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben David, Messiah ben Judah, and one would be the king and one would die. Interesting, but it still wasn't in their frame of reference. So that's the background of chapter 17. So, so 
six days later, after, you know, this whole thing goes on with Peter and the disciples, and he's going to give them the keys to the kingdom. 17.1 says, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and his brother John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Now, isn't that interesting? He took James, John, and the Antichrist up with him. He took James, John, and Satan with him. Because he just called Peter Satan. But see, this is, the, this is something where you have to understand our God. Even if we are that far off, he still gives us a chance to see him as he is. He, his heart is, is, you know, most of us understand, or many of us understand, what it's like to have or have had a rebellious child, you know. A rebellious child, you don't stop loving that child. That child doesn't stop being your child. That child, that you, don't, that it doesn't, you don't stop bending over backward for that child. Well, that's, that's if, if, if you being human, can you imagine the, our God in heaven? So he takes Peter, James, and John, and the last thing, you know, the last thing we, we know about Peter is Peter, Satan, and he takes him up to a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And then it describes transfigure, transfigured in the Greek as metamorphomai. It's where we get our word metamorphosis, and it's the, it's the, the transmutation or the, the transformation that takes place when a, when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Jesus is metamorphosized in front of them. I mean, something takes place. It's this supernatural dimension. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. So the transfiguration precedes this second event that we're going to look at. But what the transfiguration is, is, okay, you know who I am. I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God. You don't have a clue to what I'm doing. See, that's why America in particular is in a confessional moment. We don't have a rat's rear end about what God is doing. See, that's why it's a, real, a very prophetic hour. It's a confessional hour. That's why for a year we're doing the prophetic nature of the church. We're trying, to, we're trying to impart to people a vision of the real Jesus, the real church. We're trying to transfigure what Jesus is trying to do right now. It, spoiler alert, it's not make America great. Okay, can, can we eliminate one thing there? It's not that, okay? And the transfiguration is saying, before the event, before we go down to the base of the mountain and we find out that Jesus' disciples can't heal this child who's sick, and the child who's sick represents Israel, the child who is sick represents, the, the, represents apostolic failure. It, it represents the failure of God's people to understand what he's doing, why he's doing it, and how he's doing it. It represents all of these, these things, but the transfiguration takes place first. Now, the transfiguration is kind of one of those, and I've talked about those uh, when we talk about the book of Revelation. It's one of those Star Trek episodes where we have the space-time continuum, you know, just messed up. It's, you know, it's, it's Doctor Who traveling in the TARDIS and just going about doing all kind of, uh, you know, just kind of, kind of, wild and crazy things with time. It's all these time travel, alternate uh, uh, universe kind of realities. See, Jesus is an alternate universe. He's in, an alt he's in a place by himself. He is the uncreated son of God who has taken on flesh and inserted himself like a little bit of leaven being put into a large vat of dough. He's, he's inserted himself into our space-time continuum 
and he's going to transform everything. See, that's what to transfigure means, to transform. And he is going to, 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 to bring out of the cocoon of human existence a butterfly. He wants to create something along the lines of goodness and beauty and power and authority and grace and healing and the blessing that God desires. And it is a picture of the resurrection. See, Jesus is raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. I quoted that in the communion. That's Romans chapter 1. He was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. The glory of the Father is always pictured as this radiant light. See, this radiant light that comes on Jesus, it's, it's prefiguring prophetically to the disciples what not only is going to happen in his resurrection, but needs to happen for them to cast the demon out that they can't cast out right now because they, they know who Jesus is, the Christ of the Son of the living God, and they know nothing else besides that. Nothing else. They're clueless in terms of everything else. But Jesus is saying, so everything Jesus says is done in the context of the transfiguration. You can't cast out the demon now, but after I'm raised from the dead, after I've ascended to heaven, after I've become king and I pour out the spirit, you will be able to. See, that's, that's the background. So here's the story. Verse 9. We jump forward to verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. And the reason he says that is because it, it, trust me, if, if in last chapter I just told you I was going to die and, and you blew your minds, now that I'm telling you I'm going to die and I'm going to be raised from the dead, you don't, you don't have a clue, you don't even understand the first part of the equation, let alone the second part. So in verse 14, when they came to the crowd, so there's a crowd gathered at the base of this mountain, a man came to Jesus, knelt before him, and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. Now, there are just different details in these two stories, and we'll go over the other one quickly too. He's an epileptic, and he suffers terribly. Now, as an epileptic, there's, there's a neurological disorder, um, you'll see that there are, are behavioral, uh, um, uh, behavioral uh, implications because of this neurological order, which now puts it in you know, the, 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 the category of, of behavioral deficit. And the ancients, of course, believed that epilepsy was demonic in nature as well. So, so I mean, you, you got the whole ball of wax here, physical healing, casting out the demon, and, and, and significant inner healing. This, this child is, is, is messed up. He suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. So the child is a disaster waiting to happen. And I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. They couldn't heal him. In the Greek, Jesus answered. Now, Jesus is letting us know the problem, why they can't cast it out. Now, they're going to ask him why they can't cast it out, but Jesus already says it here. You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I put up with you? How much longer can I endure this? Now, again, Jesus got frustrated, okay? Frustration, righteous anger is not the same as, you know, a lot of times what we do when, when, when we, we fly off the handle. They're, they lack faith, and their whole view of reality, perverse means they have a distorted view of reality. They don't see reality the way reality is. And remember, the reason they don't see reality the way reality is is they don't see Jesus the way he is. He's the transfigured, ascended, soon to be ascended 
king installed in cosmic rule over the universe. So our problems are always unbelief, doubt, and a distorted view of things. How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon. Neurological, demonic, behavioral. Jesus rebuked a demon and it came out of him and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? He said to them, because of your little faith. Because of your too little faith. Now, he's about to tell them their too little faith is not very far from the faith that they need because they don't need a lot of faith. They don't need a lot of faith to really do this. I mean, this is like telling somebody like, who says, why couldn't I buy that, of course, I'm, I'm showing my age right now, that 10-cent pack of gum. This is because you only have a nickel, that's why. But you only need 10 cents. See, we're, we're, we really, we have to understand we are not that far. We are never that far from having faith in Jesus Christ and being able to accomplish what he wants. Because of your too little faith. Then he turns around and sounds like he contradicts himself. Contradicts himself. For I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, and the mustard seed proverbially was the smallest seed. There, were, there was... There was no seed smaller than that. So it, 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 uh, parabolically, it stood for the least amount of anything that anybody could have. It was like, it was like a penny. He, he said, if, if you have the faith of a penny, well, may, maybe they had nine cents and they, they were only short a penny and that's what they needed was, was one more penny. If you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And of course, if you have New King James, you have another verse there that is not there in your modern translations. But, but we'll see it in Mark. So let's go over to Mark and, and look at the other, just Mark's slant here. Mark chapter 9. And Mark 9, verse 14. Now, Mark, 9, Mark adds some details here that I think are highly relevant right now. Mark 9, 14 places this situation in our current context or places our current context into this story. It wasn't just a crowd, as Matthew reports it. This is what Mark says, Mark 9, 14. When they came... When they came to the disciples, coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw a great crowd around them and some of the scribes arguing with them. They're in the midst of a theological debate. That, that, just, that, that puts us where we are at today. We're fighting over this, we're fighting over that, we're fighting over this, and what, what? The suggestion is, because Jesus will tell them they don't have enough faith, but here's the suggestion in Mark that we don't necessarily see in Matthew. While we're sitting around fighting about a bunch of BS stuff in the church, fighting about stuff that is worthless, fighting about stuff that has nothing to do with the gospel. In fact, the things we're fighting about are anti-gospel, when Jesus says faithless and perverse, faithless and distorted, you're distracted by all your stupid arguments. And instead of having the kind of faith you need, instead of devoting your energies to looking at the exalted, soon to be risen, soon to be ascended, transfigured Lord, and receiving the faith you need, oh, you're fighting. And, and I, I, I have said this for close to 50 years. As long as we just keep fighting, it's, I mean, it's like, 
it's like, this is like kindergarten stuff. You know, this isn't like first grade or second grade. This is kindergarten. This is pre-K stuff. A house divided will not stand. It won't. So keep fighting over who's the president, political parties, vaccinations, masks. Just, again, Hank Allen, you can't be smart and stupid at the same time. And stupid is we will never cast the demon out at the base of the mountain that needs to be cast out while we're in the midst of all this fighting. And I mean, I've been so reduced. I'm reduced to the point of if, if you know, I'm, I feel like I'm like Abraham. Lord, if there are a hundred people, righteous people, will you not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Hey, Lord, how about 50? How about 25? How about 10? Let's see. How about 20? How about 20 people in a church, in a single local congregation, just trying to be unified? How about that, Lord? Can, can, can we start a movement with 20? Well, the Lord seemed to think you could have saved Sodom with 10. Little faith. They only needed 10 people, and they didn't have it. What does it take for there to be an explosion at 8 Mile and Shinner? 10 people on the same page, 15 people, 20 people. So they're in the midst of this dispute, and they're fighting, they're arguing. Uh, they're, they're arguing, and so Jesus comes down, and when the whole crowd saw Jesus, they were immediately overcome with awe, and they ran forward to greet him. I mean, this is, he was, had transfiguration residue on him, and they were in awe. Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son, for he has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. Now see, he calls it a spirit. It was called epilepsy in, in Matthew. He called it a spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. Wow. I, for those of you who are watching, dystonia. And that's a significant word for us here at Lord of the Harvest. A very significant word. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. He answered them, you faithless generation. See, he doesn't even use perverse in, in Mark. He uses just faithless. Faithless, perverse, fighting, arguing, distorted view of reality, not having the faith of a mustard seed. How much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Now, you have to understand this. The demon gave Jesus problems. See, we... Let's, let's, let's get to Mariush's prophecy. Mariush called me up and just had a simple prophecy. He says, Mike, I have, I have a, just a, a word from the Lord for you and the church. You are struggling with a spirit of doubt, but help is coming. You're struggling with a spirit of doubt, but help is coming. And he, 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 he wanted me to exhort the church that just, we need, he said, he said, you need to fight against doubt. Okay, fair enough. Help is coming. Jesus is coming down the mountain, guys. But let me add, because remember I said there's, this is a, a bigger picture. Let me add this to the, every Sunday since we've been back here, and I've been recording all these, I recorded on my, uh, my little, this is, this is my diary. God, God, God help us if the phone disappears, you know. Um, I write, the Lord gives me a word in worship, just this is what I'm doing at Lord of the Harvest. This is what I'm doing today. I remember the first Sunday we came back, the Lord said, this is what I'm doing today. I'm healing people. 
And, and Teresa was behind me. I said, okay, good. Teresa's healed, praise the Lord. And I said a couple others too, which I, I, won't, I won't call their names out personally here, but Teresa's a leader. That means she's a model, so she can be named publicly. Well, last Sunday, the Lord said to me, you have been Philadelphia, the faithful church, but I tell you now you're going to be the church of faith. And the Lord said these words, faith is coming. Then Mario said a couple days after that, help is coming. And see, and I heard faith is coming. War against the spirit of doubt, faith is coming. Help is coming. And, and this, is, this is what Jesus is saying. You're struggling with doubt, but I want you to walk in faith. So, so, but the demon gives Jesus trouble. And see, our tendency is when we get trouble. And you know what trouble is? God says this and the opposite happens. That's trouble. And see, when God says this and the opposite happens, you don't look at the opposite that happens and say, oh boy, we got trouble. You say, no, this is what the Lord said. That, no pun intended, trumps that. Okay. So this is what Jesus says. See, see, Jesus, the, 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 you know, the demons fought with Jesus. Okay, you see that if you, if you want to do a, a, a theology of casting out demons, I mean, the demons fought with Jesus. They didn't go out easily. Okay, some, some of them did. Some of them went out instantly. I mean, remember the difference between a miracle and healing. Those are, those are they're related, but they're not the same thing. Miracle is like, boom instantaneously healing is a process a battle a war healing is something you know Cindy Helvey always reminds us you cut yourself and the body just eventually takes care of business there eventually but if you cut yourself and it was gone the next second that would be a miracle so sometimes Jesus walked in miracles sometimes he walked in healings that's why I've been telling people well we've been praying for healings let's pray for miracles too. let's let's see some instantaneous ones. But when the demons fought against Jesus, it wasn't like, oh my God. What I, I thought I really heard God say that, but I don't, I don't think God really said that. See, that's, isn't that exactly what we do? God speaks something, the opposite happens, and the f- number one gut reaction is, I guess I didn't hear the Lord. No. No, no. I mean, we, we, we can mistakenly hear the Lord, and it's really just all we're hearing is the beating of our own heart, our own heart's desires, but Jesus, it's, it's not a big deal. So now notice what Jesus does. And, and it's, it, he, he, Jesus asks the Father in verse 21, how long has this been happening to him? And he said from childhood, it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. And Jesus said, if you are able. I mean, Jesus is like, you get what Jesus is saying. Oh, you're asking me if I'm able to do this? No, no, no. Wait a second. Did I just hear what I just heard? If I'm able Jesus said, all things can be done for the one who walks in faith. Immediately the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. I consider that the best answer, in, in uh, one of the best answers in scripture history. What, one time somebody, you know, people come to the door and, and, and they, come, they come up and they, they, they want money and usually they don't want money for what, they, what they're saying they want money for. And I'm, I'm very hesitant at giving people money. I like to put food and bus tickets and, you know, here's an address you can get. You know, you like to do that. And this person came, and honestly, I don't even remember the story. It was the best story I had ever heard. It was the best, worst story I had ever heard. It was so good... I just said, God, I've I've never done this in my life, but you deserve something for that line that you just gave me. 
that story could win an Emmy. <laughs> I gave the person money, and I just said, dear God, please let that person use the money for something legitimate. Well, this guy, you could have named him Luther, because Luther said, we are simultaneously sinners and righteous. He, that's what Luther said. In other words, he's saying, in ourselves we're sinners, but in him we're righteous. And when he said, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that, a crowd came running together. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing. This is, this is, this is so symbolic. It's, remember what Jesus says, you keep this boy from speaking and hearing because it goes right back to the transfiguration and the implications of the transfiguration. You spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse so that most of them said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he was able to stand. And when he had entered the house, the disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we cast it out? He said to them, this kind can come out only through prayer. And some translations add and fast. The reason for prayer and fasting is you guys need to pray and fast until I'm raised from the dead. And when you see me raised from the dead, you need to pray and fast until I ascend to heaven, am established in my kingship, and I send the Spirit on Pentecost. Those 10 days, they were in one accord. They were praying together. See, what, what corporate prayer buys us time until we see Jesus. Now, let's go back to Matthew 17. I, wa I wa want you to see the significance of the transfiguration. We'll, we'll reread verse 1. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling, dazzling, dazzling white. Okay, we read those verses already. Now watch. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles, three tents, three dwelling places here. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Now, here's the flaw in the disciples. They see Jesus as being equal with Moses and Elijah. Moses is the Old Testament law. Elijah speaks of the prophets. And the, the tent, the tabernacle, that's the old covenant dwelling place of the Lord. There was the tabernacle of Moses, which was the tent where he met with the Lord. There was the tabernacle of David, where is the tent where he met with David. And then there's the temple of Solomon, the temple of Herod. The temple is the place where God comes down. But we know in the book of Revelation, there's no more temple because God and the Lamb God and the Lamb are the temple. It is our, our, our flawed way of thinking, and this is flawed way of thinking, even of Scripture. We get Bible verses. See, see we, we use the Bible like people, uh, like reporters use sound bits. You know, you have an hour interview with somebody and you pick out, Five minutes here, five minutes here, five minutes here, and you make the person say what you wanted them to say. We don't, need, we, we don't look to Moses. We don't look to Elijah. We don't look to the whole old covenant system of worship. That's not going to do it. That keeps us locked into religion and keeps us from casting out the demons of our day and age, which need to be cast out, which, apart from Jesus' coming, will not be cast out. And so while, 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 you know, Satan, I mean, Peter is going through, you know, again, he's figuring out for the Lord what, what we need to do or what he needs to do. While he was yet speaking, verse 5, 
Suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, my beloved one. With him I am well pleased. In him my soul takes delight. He's my son. I love him. And he pleases my soul. Listen to him. Hear him. Listen to him. Hear his voice. And then, again, verse 8, and when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. See, the, the, the child cannot speak and the child cannot hear. The disciples can't hear. See, this was, this was Reggie Holiday's contribution. You know, because my thing is, we need to see the Lord. We need to see him like on the Mount of Transfiguration. We need to see him as in the book of Revelation. Says, yeah, we need to see him, but we need to hear him. And see, to hear means to respond to, to allow his word to get into our heart. We obey that word and we keep that word. The disciples couldn't cast the demon out because they're not listening to Jesus. Now, this is, this is Reggie's verse for the hour. Go with me to the book of Amos. Here's our confessional moment right now. This is where we're at. Because I said, Reggie, what, 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 my question was, what, what, do, what do we need to do in this, this mess that the church is in? And he went, he went I mean, I, I had, you know, I'm, I'm always talking about the transfiguration. So I, I, I talked about the transfiguration. I talked about the demon at the foot of the mountain that couldn't be cast out. And he said, well, here, here's the verse that I've been ministering. Amos 8. Verse 11 and 12. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. Now remember, it's plague, famine, war, exile. And I'm like, well, COVID's the plague, war is our division, our civil disruption, and you know, our country's going to have a civil war. Where's the famine? And then, well, here's the famine. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. We are in a famine for the word of the Lord. For, and it's, it, it doesn't say a famine for the word of the Lord. Gosh, we've, we've got the word of the Lord is prolific. It's a famine for hearing the word of the Lord. And what hearing really means is that we respond to it, we obey it. Go with me to Revelation chapter 1. Now, John sees Jesus, but John hears Jesus as well in Revelation 1. Revelation 1, 9. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation, the suffering, the affliction, and the kingdom, and the patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the day of the Lord, and the first thing is I heard. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Listen to him. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. And those of you who've been with me for any number of years, always, I've taught this so many times, hearing the voice behind him is very significant. It's, it's not even coming from the direction John's looking. And stop and think about it. John is one of the three disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. John is one of Jesus' original 12. 
this is John's an old man. I mean, John's, John's been serving the Lord for some 40 years here at this time. My gosh, the guy's written the Gospels, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. If anybody knows what Jesus is doing, it ought to be John. But it's a voice behind him. And see, that's the Lord always, always, always surprises us. It's always, he always comes from an angle. So that's, that's the Oz rule. If I can figure out what God's going to do, he's not going to do it because I can figure it out. He's gonna, it's going to be a voice from behind us. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, see what you hear and what you see. You see me transfigured. You see me unveiled in chapter one here. You see me unveiled, but you need to hear me. And to hear me means you are prepared to obey. Obey. You are prepared to do. You're prepared in the midst of a confessional moment to bear witness to me and say no to the rest of the nonsense. Verse 12. Then I turn to see the voice. See, that's amazing. To see the voice. You hear a voice. No, he's going to see the voice because he's going to see the one who is unveiled, transfigured, a fresh new revelation even for John, and he's going to hear the voice, and so it kind of becomes, you're going to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lamps. It's interesting. He hears the voice, then he turns to see the voice, which is, in essence, I'm going to see who's speaking this voice. And actually, even before he sees Jesus, he sees the church. He sees the seven golden lampstands. See, this is, it's, brethren, I'm, I've been sharing these things for 50 years. If you don't see the church, you're not seeing Jesus. And if you really see Jesus, you'll see the church. The church is at the center. The seven golden lampstands are the seven churches, but also remember they are trees of life. The church is to be a repository of life in the midst of a confessional moment that says no to the nonsense and it says yes to the Son of God. And after I saw the seven golden lampstands, in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, one like the Son of Man, and then the description is high priestly description. He sees Jesus as the high priest. And just so you, you, you believe what I said, verse 20 the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars which Jesus holds in his hands as he walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And the seven stars are his righteous remnant leadership in the church. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Now, that brings us back, and we're going to look probably two more verses and stop. How, how does the book of Revelation begin? Revelation 1, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads, and remember, to read meant to read aloud. See, the, the, the epileptic child cannot speak and he cannot hear. And when the true prophetic word comes forth, to God's people, they can now speak and they can hear. They hear the voice, but they proclaim what they speak. By hearing the voice and seeing the, 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 the high priest of God's kingdom, they become an apostolic and prophetic people who proclaim. They speak. Blessed is he who reads aloud and those who do what? Hear the words of the prophecy. It's my beloved son. Hear him. No, you don't need Moses. No, you don't need Elijah. No, you don't need the whole old covenant system of worship. Hear him. Blessed are those who read aloud, who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it. To keep means, to hear means I, uh, reading aloud means, see, to say something. See, I, some things that I just read silently in myself, I may or may not remember those things, but when I get up and speak it, I never forget. I don't forget things that I've proclaimed here. So there's something about reading aloud. It's a three-step three process. 
the, the declaring it aloud or hearing it aloud in your ear from Jesus speaking it causes you to hear it, to respond to it, to hearken to it, to take it to heart. And then third, you keep it. See, keeping it is obeying it. And notice in the seven churches, it's all, and you've kept this, and, you know, you've, you've kept my word, you've not denied my name, you've kept this works, and you've kept that, and you've kept my commandment here, and you've, you keep it. And then in chapter 22 of Revelation, look at how the book ends. It starts there, and look how it ends. This is how it ends. In chapter 21, it's the New Jerusalem. Chapter 22, it's the restored Eden. And then verse 6 in chapter 22. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the spirits of the prophets have, has sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps, keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Hear him means to obey him. Last passage, and this is a, every time you ask Reggie Holiday what's going on, he, he, he quotes this. Go with me to uh, 1 Timothy And we'll close here. Maybe it's Second Timothy. Let's see. Timothy is kind of like a blur to me. It's all the same place. It's all the same thing. Um, no, it might be First Timothy. Let's see. Timothy just disappeared from my Bible here. Um, I only looked at this verse. Yes. Um, no, that's not it either. Yes, it is 2 Timothy chapter 4. Okay. 2 Timothy 4. I'm going to read the first four verses. I solemnly charge you. This is Paul writing to Timothy, and the significance of 2 Timothy 4 is this is the last thing Paul says to Timothy. Timothy is his son in the faith. Timothy is, is this young man that, that Paul mentored, and Paul is about to die. He's going to be executed, and he's, he, Timothy is the leader in the church in Ephesus, and he is, he's, he's giving Timothy final direction. I solemnly charge you, and, and that word in the Greek means I command you to bear witness to the things that you have been given in the gospel. This is kind of a summary statement of First and Second Timothy. It's Paul's laid out the gospel responsibilities of Timothy. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Jesus the Messiah, the one who is about to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance and his kingdom. See, Jesus appears, Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus speaks, we hear, Jesus appears, Revelation 1, speaks to John and commissions him to bear witness to him and his kingdom. See, bearing witness to him is, who do men say that I am? The Christ, the Son of the living God. Got it. 
How am I going to establish my kingdom? Oh, Lord, we've got a hundred million opinions how you're going to do it. No, I'm going to die. No, 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 Lord. See, that's, we, we bear witness, not just to Jesus, but the kingdom. The kingdom is the way God acts in human history to establish his purposes and to bring that blessing that he commanded the man and the woman in the beginning to be stewards of the blessings of God's creation. So in the presence of God and Jesus Christ, who is about to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly charge you, I solemnly urge you. And this is what he tells Timothy to do. Preach the word. And preach is to apostolically proclaim the charisma, the, the foundational message of the gospel. It's a confessional moment. It's confess the gospel. Preach the word is equivalent of confess the gospel. Make a confessional statement, and when that gospel is endangered, take a stand, like McGlasson says, for instance, like Luther did, like Bonhoeffer did, like our brothers and sisters in China and Iran and, and, and other places are doing right now, and we must do in America. Preach the word. Proclaim the gospel. Be ready in season and out of season. Be ready to do that whether the time seems appropriate or the time seems inappropriate. And then he, he says there are three things you have to do. You have to convict. You have to rebuke. You have to exhort with all long suffering and teaching. This is how you proclaim the word. You proclaim the word by convicting, by rebuking, and by exhorting. Really, um, two of those three words are negative. But you do it with long suffering and teaching. Long suffering is the Greek word that means you don't get angry. If people aren't responding to it, you just keep at it, knowing the power is in the word, not in you. And continue to teach the word. That's, that's what we're doing here at Lord of the Harvest. Now here's the key. This is the confessional moment we're in. For there will be a time when people will not bear, they will not put up with sound teaching. Brethren, we're, we're there today. I mean, to, to me, the, the, the answers to, to what people, the questions people are asking right now in all this confusion in the body of Christ, it's, it's a simple matter of the Word of God. The Word of God answers it. It's, it's, it's not rocket science. It's, it's pretty simple. But people are in a place, they are refusing to listen even to the Word of God. Hear him. This is my beloved son, hear him. You, you got to listen to him. You have to respond to him. You have to be willing to be obedient to the word. They will not put up with sound teaching, but according to their own desires, their own preconceived desires of what they want from God and how they want the kingdom to work out, just like Peter in Matthew 16, and that's the Peter that Jesus looked at and said, get behind me, Satan. According to their preconceived desires, they will accumulate for themselves teachers who tickle the ear. And you know what tickle the ear means? Just say what we want them to say. We will troll the internet until we find somebody who agrees with what we want right now. Not what Jesus wants. Not what Jesus is going to say. Not what Jesus is going to command. But what our preconceived notions want. And this is called... We are in big trouble because the simple teaching of the word, I've been doing this for 50 years, the simple teaching of the word goes nowhere with people because they have postured themselves in a place where it says they will not 
tolerate sound doctrine. They won't, they won't tolerate healthy teaching. They, they've already made up in their minds, this is the reality we want. Now, why is that dangerous times? Okay, two, two other examples from Genesis. After the man and the woman partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the Lord says, we got to get them out of the garden. Because if they partake of the tree of life, when they're in this state where they see themselves as gods, and remember, seeing yourself as a god just means I personally determine what's good and evil. If I think this scenario is good, I call it good, and those who oppose that is evil. And the Lord said, if, if, if they get a hold of the tree of life, get them out of there. And so the Lord places the cherubim, the fiery cherubim, guarding them, keeping them out of the garden, and expels them. The second one takes place a few chapters later, where they build the Tower of Babel. And the Lord comes down and says, oh my gosh, they're, they're building a tabernacle here, a, a temple that stretches from earth to heaven. Now remember, I mean, those were the days where you could still live to be like six, seven hundred years old and all that, you know. You, you got a lot of time to work on things, okay. When, I, when my wife, who's now retired, I just tell her she wakes up, I go, what do you have to do today? You have the rest of your life to do it. Imagine back then. Well, you're only a you're only a hundred years old. You got six hundred years left. <laughs> but rem, but the Lord actually is us. There are only a couple times in Scripture where the Lord's astounded. He said, "My God, if I allow them to do this, anything that they imagine, they will be able to do." See, the, when God says you're in a dangerous time, and you're in a dangerous time when you have so superimposed your desires, what you want out of life, and you call that God, and you call that Jesus, and you call that the kingdom. We're in a confessional moment because there are a lot of people saying a lot of things, this is Jesus and that isn't Jesus, and, and they, they, to quote the book of Revelation, they lie and they do not speak the truth. It's, their, it, it's a makeup Jesus. It's a fantasy Jesus. It's a Laodicean Jesus. And that's why we're in a confessional moment. And what they do is they start with a desire. This is what I want. And screw all the rest of you, including you, God. You're here to do what I want. You're here to be the God that I say you are. Not, here's my beloved son, listen to him. It's, you listen to me. And then they just troll. They troll, and they find this article, and this th conspiracy theory, and this, these facts, and all of these things, and, and, and easily refuted by simple scripture. We're in a confessional moment here. And the problem is there is a famine for hearing the word of God. That's where the famine is. We know where the plague is, COVID. We know where the war is, the potential civil war in America, or leave America's borders and there are wars everywhere. We know where the wars are. Where's the famine? Well, there are some literal famines. I don't mean to denigrate literal famines. Shoot, Uganda was just going through one. Kenya was going through one. We have brothers and sisters. They're real famine. But there is a famine for hearing the word of God. And that's what 2 Timothy 4 is describing. They will accumulate to them teachers who tickle the ears. They'll find some authority or group of authorities who will agree with their antichrist nonsense. By antichrist, I just mean hear Jesus. That's all you need to do is to hear Jesus. And then it says, and... They will turn their ear away from the truth. And they will be turned aside to myths, to stories. A story, a rationale, a justification. Here's why what I believe is the truth. And they'll just cite this, that. Remember, knowledge has exploded. See, knowledge is not the same as 
conceptual framework. See, you can take this fact and this fact and this fact, and they're not, they're not coherent. You don't connect them with each other. You don't connect them with each other, and so they don't make any coherent sense. But you'll take this fact, this fact, and this fact, and you'll say, well, that's true, and that's true, and that's true. This is how these kind of myths work and conspiracy theories. They'll give you three truths, and then they'll jump to a conclusion that's got nothing to do with those three truths. And you've just been sideswiped. Well, if this is true, and this is true, and this is true, then the fourth point here they said must be true. No, it's got nothing to do. This has nothing to do with that. They're going to be turned aside from hearing Jesus to myths. Father, help us. I, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank you for Pastor Mariusz. I thank you for our studies these last year and a half in Scripture. I thank you, Jesus, that you appear and that when you appear, you speak. And when you appear and speak, we are called to hear you, to listen to you, to trust you, to obey you, Father. Uh, grant, Lord God, um, the grace to hear Jesus, to see Jesus, and to cast out the demons at the foot of the mountain that we can only do when we in the body of Christ walk in unity. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. God bless you, brother. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.